7 on Arizona PBS. Support for Arizona PBS comes from viewers like you and from... Support comes from Copenhagen, celebrating 48 years of innovative design. From the iconic to the up and coming, design is the heart of our business. Copenhagen, Phoenix Scottsdale, Tempe. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS, a community service of Arizona State University. This is a good one. Is it my birthday? Now you can access more of your favorite PBS shows than ever before. You don't mean it. Yes. Introducing PBS Passport, a new member benefit that lets you binge the latest seasons and catch up on your favorites. You've made me a happy man. Anytime you want, anywhere you are. Unbelievable. Awesome, isn't it? Support your PBS station and get Passport. Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Your favorite PBS shows, ready to watch when you are, anytime, any place. Find more ways to explore than ever before. Support for Arizona PBS comes from viewers like you and from Hospice of the Valley, medical, social, and spiritual care for patients nearing end of life and support for their families. A not-for-profit community hospice, hov.org. studios in downtown Phoenix. This is Cronkite News. Valley community leaders are weighing in on Governor Doug Ducey's newly proposed Safe Arizona Schools plan. Find out why not everyone is welcoming the plan with open arms. Plus, how the end of DACA could have a significant impact on Arizona's restaurant industry and where you eat. And a new grocery store that's by vegans for vegans. What these owners want you to know about their new Glendale business. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Tyler Pelly. And I'm Jamie Fossenkemper. Thank you for joining us. In the midst of a massive school safety debate, high school students in Maryland faced a shooter this morning. A student at Great Mills High School shot two students before the student resource officer pulled a gun on the suspect. Investigators say both the resource officer and the shooter fired, a, fired around the same time. The shooter was later pronounced dead, but it is unclear if the resource officer's bullet hit the suspect. The female victim, who had a prior relationship with the shooter, is in critical condition. The other victim is in stable condition. This comes as community leaders are responding to Governor Doug Ducey's Safe Arizona Schools plan. Reporter Emily Richardson spoke with two activists about why they think the proposed plan doesn't go far enough. Community activists Jennifer Longden and Lawrence Robinson have been working together on ending gun violence for more than a decade now. But for Longden, a survivor of gun violence, this issue is personal. 13 years ago, I was shot in a random shooting. Uh, I was in a car with my fiance. Uh, we were ambushed in a random shooting, uh, pulling into a taco shop. Uh, he was shot in the head and I was shot in the back and paralyzed. Jennifer Longden and Lawrence Robinson say that gun violence is a main concern for their community. And while Governor Doug Ducey's plan is a good first step, the state of Arizona needs to take bigger steps towards a solution. I think the governor himself and all of us know that it doesn't go far enough. You can't compromise with kids' lives. My 12-year-old son was ripped out of his warm bed at 1030 at night and brought to a trauma room. He was so brave and so scared. Our children should never have to be that brave or that afraid. And adults need to step up and be responsible and fearless and get this done. Both Robinson and Longden are currently running for public office. 
Their proposed plan has eight parts that they believe could help prevent gun violence without disrupting Second Amendment rights. To them, gun violence isn't a partisan issue. It's a community one. If this is just a story about what happens here in the Capitol behind us, uh, then we lose the reality that the, the real story is happening in our streets and neighborhoods. That together we can work to help end this for, uh, for our communities overall. Robinson says the best way for Arizonans to show their support for gun reform is to make their opinions heard by attending events such as the March for Our Lives happening this coming Saturday. Emily Richardson, Cronkite News. Those March for Our Lives events will be held in cities across the country, including here in Phoenix. But the biggest march is expected in Washington, where city officials are bracing for the crowds. Cronkite News reporter Austin Bundy in our Washington Bureau has details on the preparations. Washington officials said they are anticipating hundreds of thousands of students to gather here Saturday for the March for Our Lives. The student march to call for gun reform in the wake of the Parkland shooting is expected to be the biggest event since last year's Women's March, which brought up to a million people to town. Metropolitan Police Chief Peter Newsom said there will not be security checkpoints for this march, but reassured participants they have nothing to worry about. I would urge uh, young people who are interested in coming, uh, they're co coming to one of the safest cities in the country, uh, and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we have a successful event. March for Our Lives President Dina Katz said what was going to be a march has now turned into a rally due to the sheer size of the expected crowd, making a physical march nearly impossible. We had talked about a march, but because of the amount of people that we're expecting, we are closing down all of Pennsylvania Avenue from 12th down to 3rd, and we feel like it's the movement of everybody getting here, and that will culminate at the stage at 3rd and Pennsylvania. Newsom said large crowds are not uncommon for the district, noting that the annual Cherry Blossom Festival starts Sunday, and the city is ready. Uh, I would say that this city is probably in better shape to handle these types of events uh, than any, any other city. In Washington, Austin Bundy, Cronkite News. Cronkite News will have team coverage of this weekend's March for Our Lives events. Find us on our social channels and at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. The FBI is expanding their investigation into a recent string of serial bombings happening in cities surrounding Austin, Texas. Just this morning, a package destined for Austin exploded at a FedEx ground distribution facility near San Antonio. One employee had minor injuries but was not taken to the hospital. This is the fifth explosion in three weeks of a device either in Austin or meant to be delivered to the city. Two people were killed and four others were injured from the previous bombs. Authorities say the package in the Schertz facility wasn't the only one that they found. There was one other package that we believe was uh, also um, loaded with an explosive device. We reached out to the FedEx for comment on the ongoing investigation. They said, quote, we have provided law enforcement responsible for this investigation extensive evidence related to these packages and the individual that shipped them. The safety and security measures in place across the FedEx networks are designed to protect the safety of our people, customers, and communities, and to assist law enforcement as appropriate. Arizona Senator Jeff Flake says members of Congress need to be vocal in support of special counsel Mueller finishing his investigation into Russian election tampering, or else it could lead to a constitutional crisis. This afternoon, Flake tweeted, quote, we are begging the president not to fire the special counsel, end quote, adding that on the only constitutional remedy after that would be impeachment and that, quote, no one wants that outcome. The Trump administration has said that a Mueller firing is not being discussed. Arizona Senator John McCain criticized President Trump for congratulating Vladimir Putin on winning the election. I had a uh, call with President Putin and congratulated him on the victory, his electoral victory. So I think probably we'll be uh, seeing President Putin in the not too distant future. McCain wrote, quote, President Trump insulted every Russian citizen who was denied the right to vote in a free and fair election to determine their country's future, including the countless Russian patriots who have risked so much to pro protest and resist Putin's regime. Jury selection is underway in a Tucson federal court for a rare second-degree murder trial of a U.S. Border Patrol agent. Agent Lonnie Swartz is accused of killing 16-year-old Jose Antonio Elena Rodriguez, who was on the street in Nogales, Mexico, just across the border from Nogales, Arizona. An autopsy showed the teen was shot 10 times. 
Swartz lawyers have said Rodriguez threw rocks just before he was shot to create a distraction from drug smugglers and that the agent was justified in using lethal force. Investigators in Tempe say it's still too early to determine who was at fault in a fatal collision involving a self-driving Uber SUV. The 49-year-old woman was not walking in a crosswalk as she crossed Mill Avenue. Police said today she stepped into the road right in front of the car. The vehicle was operating in full autonomous mode and going an estimated 40 miles an hour at the time she was hit. The operator behind the wheel of the Uber has been identified as a woman who'd previously served time in prison for armed, attempted armed robbery. Uber said today the employee cleared all state hiring requirements. Uber's self-driving operations have been suspended nationwide pending two separate federal, federal investigations into the deadly accident. The Scottsdale School Board is meeting this afternoon to discuss the possible dismissal of its superintendent and chief operating officer. Cronkite News was there last month when parents, students, and teachers rallied to draw attention to investigations into Denise Birdwell and Lewis Hartwell. Both have been on paid leave since February, pending investigations into district finances, bidding practices, and potential conflicts of interest. While well, revoking DACA could cause trouble for one local Valley business. Coming up on Cronkite News. The businesses plead to lawmakers to protect DACA recipients and keeping the industry thriving while keeping the environment safe. Miners gathered at the state capitol to discuss the future of their business. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. Millions of people die every year from drinking dirty water. I would never have felt I had the ability to do something without ASU pushing me. We built filtration systems out of local materials with the people. To see those kids drink clean water for the first time, it's the most rewarding feeling that you can ever have. I went to ASU because I wanted to change the world. The thing I never would have expected is how the world would have changed me. Amid the uncertain future of DACA, young immigrants are not the only ones concerned about an end to that program. Business owners will also see an impact. Reporter Adriana de Alba explores how ending DACA would have a serious impact on Arizona's restaurant industry. At the Wildflower Bread Company, preparing baked goods may be a never-ending cycle, but it's also a blessing for Claudia Gutierrez, who works as the company's head pastry chef. I love what I do. I love pastry, but the main thing is because we are like a family, that they care for each other. She started in the company's sanitation department. Today, she's a manager at its headquarters and also happens to be a DACA recipient. The thought of losing that protection weighs on her shoulders every day. But it's here where she has found someone to lean on, the company's founder, Louis Basil. As soon as you know, we start about here in DACA, like he helped me a lot. 
Over the course of 22 years, Basile has expanded Wildflower to 14 locations around Arizona. For him, the so-called dreamers have been an integral part of his company, and he wants his voice as a restaurant owner to be heard. They are a part of this country, and we need to remove the uncertainty that somehow suggests that they're not an integral part of what makes America great. In a letter written to Arizona Senator John McCain, Basile urges him to find a long-term solution for DACA recipients in limbo, stressing that dreamers make up more than 5% of his employees. But 57% of the dreamers stay with Wildflower for more than three years. The New American Economy estimates that more than 18% of DACA-eligible employees make up the restaurant industry, the number one field they work in. The simple reality is, is that we need employees our best, some of our best employees are our dreamers and our DACA employees. There is an argument, of course, that uh, these are folks who are coming here and taking jobs from Americans. Uh, the reality, of course, is that if you do the math, uh, you realize that we're at full employment and yet many, many of these undocumented workers are working. Um, and so they're not taking jobs, they're filling jobs uh, that would not be filled otherwise. While ending DACA would have an economic impact for Basile and his business, he says it really boils down to a humanitarian issue. The dreamers are the American dream, okay? They want to work hard. They don't mind starting at the bottom and working their way up. You heard from Claudia where she started, okay? That's not dissimilar to my situation. I started in the restaurant business as a dishwasher, and here I am as the founder and owner of the Wildflower. So that dream exists. However, we have to give people the opportunity opportunity to actually achieve that dream. In Scottsdale, Adriana de Alba, Cronkite News. Basile is currently working on opening three additional wildflower locations, but says the biggest challenge restaurant owners face is the ongoing issue of finding good staff to run their restaurants. A recent decision by President Trump's administration will have an impact on the mining industry. Reporter Megan Meyer takes us to the Capitol to discuss this change with those who are directly affected. Members of Arizona's mining community gathered at the Capitol. The event is really to promote the mining industry and what it does for its communities both locally and globally. Currently 65 percent of the nation's copper is mined in Arizona. Minerals such as copper contribute heavily to the manufacture of everyday items. Items such as cell phones, computers and motor vehicles. But producing these materials comes at a cost. Over 40,000 jobs are generated by the mining industry here in AZ, but the environmental impact of the field has always been a concern. Back in late November, President Trump's administration announced that they will no longer require mining groups to prove that they have set aside the financial means for cleanup. This was a requirement under the Obama administration. The EPA says state and federal rules already address this issue, and the companies we spoke with didn't think the regulation rollback would be a problem. All of the companies that I dealt with in the 36 years I've been in the industry have always been responsible in that regard and um, will continue to be. Many express that their company's plans to remain environmentally friendly will not waver. We pride ourselves as being stewards of, of the areas where we mine, and, and so I can't see where it, it would largely impact our company in the way we do things because I believe we, we strive to do the right thing regardless of what the law requires. In Phoenix, Megan Meyer, Cronkite News. Well, eating vegan can sometimes be difficult because of limited options. But one Valley store is changing that. Coming up on Cronkite News, an inside look at the first vegan grocery store in Glendale. And our temperatures have really felt like spring lately, but we're going to have highs in the 90s later this week. I'll tell you when, coming up. I'm Ted Simons, host and managing editor of Arizona Horizon. Join us each weekday at 5.30 and 10 as we bring you the top newsmakers who impact the state. We cover the stories in depth that shape and affect our local communities, and we take the time to ensure that all voices are equally heard. For more than 30 years, Arizona Horizon has been your voice and your source for what matters most, right here on Arizona PBS.
Fridays, it's at Cronkite News, your social sharing connection where you choose the news. Facebook likes and shares, tweets, retweets, and favorites. YouTube views and subscriptions. We're watching you watch us. From our digital home at cronkitenews.azpbs.org to your television, web browser, or mobile device. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Then join us for At Cronkite News, our weekly refresh, each Friday at 5 on Arizona PBS. The demand for plant-based foods is rising, and two long-term vegans in the Valley decided to start their own business because of it. I went to visit the newest all-vegan grocery store in Glendale to talk to the owners about how they plan on staying successful. Well, I'm a long-time vegan, and it is something that Phoenix desperately needs. After Sandra McKee and her husband took a trip to the vegan hotspot of Portland, they were inspired to start their own company, Veggie Rebellion. So we chose Glendale because there's nothing. Like this is the vegan wasteland. There's no vegan restaurants, there are no grocery stores. McKee says even though other places carry vegan options, people would be willing to travel for an all vegan store. Aubrey King, who switched to a vegan lifestyle a year ago, says the drive would be worth it. As a vegan, all of that would be so accessible in one spot, so I would be able to just get everything just as much, and it's specifically geared towards vegans. According to Inova Market Insights, businesses that promoted vegetarian or vegan accounted for 17 percent of all product launches in the U.S., compared to 6 percent five years ago. And while Scottsdale was recently named the eighth best vegan-friendly city in the country, one economist believes that this West Side opening could be a hit or miss. Being the only vegan grocery store in the area might be a signal that nobody needs a vegan grocery store in the area, or it might just be that that's the very last thing that was needed um, for, for the areas. But Rudiger believes that it could also be the start to something big. One store always needs to make the start for, for something else to develop. The owners of Veggie Rebellion say they are embracing their individuality. We have products that nobody carries in the state, nobody carries in the Western Hemisphere. Like there, There's a lot of products that we deal with directly that um, nobody can find anywhere else in Arizona. McKee says the majority of their product comes from a national distributor, but she personally reads every label to ensure her stock meets all expectations. NASA released 12 new photos of deep sky objects. The Hubble Space Telescope, launched in 1990, pictured these new images. M62, seen here, is almost 12 billion years old. M75, located in the Sagittarius constellation, is 67,000 light years away. M95 is an A-spiral galaxy that can be seen with binoculars. It has 40 billion stars. The nine other pictures included globular clusters in the Milky Way and other constellations. Well, Jamie, it was beautiful today in the valley, but will this last through the weekend? Courtney Malley is tracking our forecast. Thanks, Tyler and Jamie. Our temperatures this week have felt just like spring, which is perfect because our, our high temperature of 78 degrees is right on par with the first day of spring for the year. But first, let's take a look at our evening temperatures as things cool down just a little bit. In the valley, it's gonna be in the mid to upper 60s for your evening, so why don't you eat dinner outside, take a nice walk, it'll be a pleasant evening. But you need to take note, for Thursday, our high is going to be 93 degrees, which is one degree lower than our 1990 record and about 16 degrees above average. Uh, for, as your work week wraps up, it's going to be 85 degrees tomorrow, 92 on Thursday, 80 on Friday. And with a storm system coming in from the west, our temperatures are going to drop back down into the seasonal temperatures that we typically see in the mid to lower 70s. For Cronkite Weather, I'm Courtney Malley. If there was a mass flu outbreak, would Maricopa County be able to treat a mass amount of people? Coming up next on Cronkite News, how the county is preparing itself in the event of an epidemic.
Cronkite News weeknights at 5 on Arizona PBS. Third Rail with Ozzy. The new weekly show where we tackle the taboo and debate the tough questions with some of the most interesting minds in the game. I'm Carlos Watson. Electrifying conversation. Friday, only on PBS. It's the lifeblood of the mission. Human beings are a curious bunch. What are we going to see when we get really close? Wow. Just because an idea is crazy, it's not necessarily wrong. We were on our way. You don't get anywhere until you've tested the limits. That carries an intensity you can't imagine. You could hear people just, whoa. Oh my God, absolutely spectacular. It's a rush. We ask a lot of our heroes. We are at a remarkable moment. We're going farther than any exploration ever has. If there were an anthrax attack or a countywide flu epidemic, would you know what to do? Reporter Sydney Eisenberg shows us how the Maricopa County Department of Public Health is preparing for such an event. School may be on break at Basha High School, but there is still learning going on. The Maricopa County Department of Public Health held a point of dispensing drill to simulate what would happen if Maricopa County experienced a pandemic illness or bioterrorism attack. The goal was to see how quickly the department and volunteers could set up a point of dispensing or pod site in order to screen residents and dispense life-saving medication. We try to plan for a worst case scenario and that's to give um, you know, the medication to all four and a half million residents within 48 hours. During an emergency, vehicles would enter into the pod site, would immediately be screened and then sent down to dispensing where they would be given the proper medication for the type of outbreak. The Department of Public Health has over 100 pod sites across the county that could be used. The sites would only be activated if a mass dispensing of medication was needed. However, Castle says that the department is always prepared. I would love to say that the, the chances of that happening are, are slim to none, but unfortunately you never know what's going to happen or occur. Castle says Maricopa County residents can protect themselves from some possible epidemics by staying up to date on vaccinations. In Chandler, Sydney Eisenberg, Cronkite News. The department plans on practicing these dispensing drills every three to five years in order to stay prepared. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's coming up on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. On the next Arizona Horizon, we'll take a look at local housing prices and we'll hear about and hear from the Phoenix Symphony Chorus. It's on the next Arizona Horizon. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour escaped the harrowing story of two Nigerian women who survived being kidnapped by Boko Haram as girls. That's Tuesday on the PBS news hour. That's it for Cronkite news tonight. Thanks for joining us for top Arizona stories. Anytime go to Cronkite news Jackie Robinson. Robinson comes out swinging. He had purchased the right to speak his mind many times over. And builds a lasting legacy beyond baseball. The conclusion of Jackie Robinson. Tonight at 8 on Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS. A community service of Arizona State University. 
Hi, I'm Paula Kerger, president of PBS. The programs you love to watch, like Antiques Roadshow, PBS NewsHour, and one of my favorites, Downton Abbey, are here because people in your community and across the country, like-minded people who love great programs, have made a financial gift. Viewer support, that's you calling or going to our secure website right now, are the single largest source of funding for all the programs you love and can't find anywhere else. Riveting masterpiece dramas, fascinating Ken Burns documentaries, and the best performing arts programs anywhere. Please, take a moment right now and fund your favorites, the programs you love to watch every week. Thanks. Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Find more ways to explore at pbs.org slash anywhere. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. This week on Me Too, Now What? The uncomfortable conversations men need to have. Speaking, engaging, confronting. Why are they afraid to talking about it? This one scared men more than any yes. of the other ones. Exactly. Do they have the courage to speak up? It is important to recognize if we do speak up, there could be cost to us. Are they all complicit? Consent is what this is all about, making her say yes. Friday night at 7.30 on Arizona PBS. My name is Stephen Hawking. Come with me and I will tell you the story of how I became who I am. He would spend a lot of time looking at the stars. Oh, he was great fun. He was eccentric. We were going to defy the disease. We were going to challenge the future. Here, time stops. You've reached the true beginning of everything. Friday night at 9 on Arizona PBS. Support for Arizona PBS comes from viewers like you and from the Persian Room. Travel to another world, to a land of exotic aromas and period decor for a fine dining experience. The Persian Room in North Scottsdale on Scottsdale Road, one light north of Frank Lloyd Wright Boulevard. Gourmet exotic cuisine at its best. Desert Caballeros Western Museum presents its 13th annual Cowgirl Up. Art from the other half of the West. Exhibition March 23rd through May 13th with artwork by women artists from across the nation. Details at westernmuseum.org. Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll take a look at housing prices in the valley, where they are and where they're heading. And we'll enjoy a visit from the Phoenix Symphony Chorus. Those stories and more next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. Senator John McCain today slammed President Trump. That's after the president made a congratulatory phone call to Russian President Vladimir Putin for winning another term in office. In a statement, McCain said, quote, an American president does not lead the free world by congratulating dictators on winning sham elections. And by doing so with Vladimir Putin, President Trump insulted every Russian citizen who was denied the right to vote in a free and fair election to determine their country's future, including the countless Russian patriots who have risked so much to protest and resist Putin's regime. President Trump later expounded on the nature of the phone call. I had a uh, call with President Putin and congratulated him on the victory, his electoral victory. We had a very good call, and I suspect that we'll probably be meeting in the not-too-distant future to discuss uh, the arms race, which is getting out of control. But we will never allow anybody to have anything even close to what we have. The president did not say if he mentioned U.S. sanctions on Russia for cyber attacks or the Kremlin's apparent role in the poisoning of a former Russian spy and his daughter in England. And Arizona Senator Jeff Flake came out today and used the word impeachment in reacting to reports that President Trump could be close to firing special counsel Robert Mueller. Flake said that Congress cannot preempt the president from making such a move, but lawmakers can remedy the situation after the fact through impeachment. It's the first time Flakes used the word in responding to the president's actions in office. 
Well, Arizona's housing prices are on the rise, though the numbers are still well below pre-recession levels. That's according to analysis by CoreLogic, which also shows that national housing prices are 1% above those pre-recession levels. Joining us now is Mark Staff of ASU's WP Carey Center for Real Estate Theory and Practice to talk about all this. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. The state of the Phoenix housing market right now, what are we looking at? Um, I think it's one very solid. I think the metropolitan area is in a very uh, good uh, economic position. It's very diversified. Our population growth has picked up of late as has the uh, employment growth. And both of those are the indicators of a strong economy and that's what drives the housing market. So I think we're in pretty good shape but I think we're building to about equilibrium. Interesting. Better? Are we in better shape than we were a year ago? Um, I think we're in similar shape to where we were ago. I wouldn't say we were better. I think there are some things that are still affecting the marketplace and still affecting pricing. Um, we haven't been able to, to deal with those effectively. What are those things? Um, so there's, there's a lack of available, um, developable, platted lots for publicly tr traded in um, you know, regional builders to build on, and so that keeps a damper on supply. It's pushing the supply for more affordable homes to the edges again. Um, I think that there continues to be significant labor problems, which push pricing up, and there's been inflation and materials costs, and all of those things push pricing up, and that makes affordability an issue. The hot areas right now, what's hot and where are things uh, kind of cool? Um, well, I think we're seeing a more even distribution of uh, recovery in the marketplace. So we are seeing uh, development back in areas where in the pre-recession we saw it, so back in Buckeye, north uh, west Peoria, out in the Pinal County. Uh, those areas are showing some strong growth again because that's where the more affordable homes can be built right now. What about condos and townhomes? Um, still very good demand for, for them. Um, you know, we're, we're not changing this pattern which we started to develop in the recession, but we can't accommodate all of our growth uh, through condos and townhomes. But I don't think we're going to see a change in this densification of the urban area. The 16% below pre-recession levels, what's that all? Were we, were we just so down that even it's going to be really hard to climb back up that hill? It has been really hard to climb out of uh, the recession, and some of it has to do with uh, wage growth. And so we've had population growth, we've had employment growth, but wage growth has lagged. In fact, we still lag the, the nation in per capita income. And we have just really gotten back um, to where we were pre-recession with per capita income. And that's in real dollars, which means in terms of present value, we're still lagging. But, I mean, considering the explosive nature of 12 years ago and what resulted from that explosion, is it such a bad thing that we're not at pre-recession levels? No, I mean, I think our economy's in, in, pretty, in really good shape. Um, but it's, we've adjusted to a new normal, I think. And we are building, as I said earlier, about the equilibrium. So, you know, we're seeing population growth tick up to about 2.2%. If you look at what we have in Metro Phoenix, that means there's going to be about 115,000, 120,000 new people. You break that down into in the households, and there's about 25, 28,000 new households that we're going to have to accommodate this coming year. And that's about what we're building to. So I don't